The number of jobs in traditional manufacturing today is half of what it was in 1980. This is the same in Italy, in the US, in France, in Japan, um, even in Germany, which many people think is this manufacturing paradise. We have half of the job, half of the blue collar jobs today than 30 years ago. By contrast, jobs in innovation keep growing. Uh, just to give you a sense, consider that over the past decade, jobs in the internet sector in the US have grown at a rate which is 25 times faster than the rest of the US labor market. Uh, if you look at the data, it's, this growth is explosive, and the recession didn't slow it down. For all the complaints about Bangalore and outsourcing, jobs in software in the US have been growing at a rate which is 18 times faster than the rest of the US labor market. Jobs in biotech, jobs in pharmaceutical, and in general in life science are also growing pretty quickly. Um, the importance of high tech and life science and the broadly defined innovation sector is clear when you look at what parts of the US are growing today. Now the US labor market is not in good shape. There are a big part of this country that are still hurting, they're still in a recession. But there are other parts of this country that are doing fairly well. There are actually some parts that are booming. Places like here, the, the San Jose metro area, or the San Francisco metro area, or Seattle, or Boston, or DC, or Austin, <coughs> or Raleigh Durham, all these places are actually undergoing a profound and deep economic boom that is driven by tech growth. Um, what these cities have in common are two things. One, they have a labor force that is one of the most educated and most skilled in the world. At least 40% of the workers in these cities have a college degree or a master degree. And two, they have a very high penetration of employers in the tech sector or in the life science sector. Um, it's not just jobs that are growing in these places, it's also labor productivity is very high. It's in fact one of the highest in the world. Um, creativity and innovation of the labor force are the highest in the world. So it's not surprising that wages are also some of the highest in the world, in, the, in these cities. The average salary in these innovation hubs is much higher than the average salary in the rest of the US. And what's striking is that the gap keeps growing with every passing year. Now we know everything about the high salaries here, but you know, let's take Austin, which is not such a high cost of living place. You look at Austin, 1980, Austin's salaries on average were 75% lower than the, than the salaries in Flint or in Detroit. Today, salaries in Austin are 80% higher than the salaries in Flint or Detroit. So it's a remarkable success story. Um, and the growth of these innovation hubs is causing a profound redistribution of jobs, of wealth, and people away from the old center of economic growth in the US to these new centers of growth, the innovation hubs. Just think about this. An ever-increasing fraction of US GDP is generated in seven key metro areas. San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, Austin, Boston, DC, and Raleigh. Okay. The share of the rest of the US keeps shrinking. The share of these seven cities keep growing at an accelerating rate. Now, an important aspect of this growth is that it's not just the people who work in tech that are benefiting from these new jobs and these high wages, but it's all workers who work in those communities who are benefiting. Um, in particular, there is an important job multiplying job multiplier effect that takes place when tech establish itself in a, in a city and start growing. What you see is broad-based job growth in most part of the local economy, including outside the tech sector, especially in the local service sector. In other words, when Google hires engineers in Mountain View, it indirectly creates jobs for people who provide services to those engineers. Some of the jobs are non-professional, like the taxi drivers, the plumbers, the carpenters, 
the child care specialist, the dog walkers uh, that provide services to those new residents of the community. Other, some, some other of these jobs are actually good jobs, professional jobs, well-paying jobs. The real estate agents, the doctors, the lawyers, the architects. All these people have jobs because Google created jobs in the first place uh, and, and those positions indirectly supported more local service jobs. Uh, Fernando, uh, you are just back from New York uh, where you organize an important summit for the Italian Business Investment Initiative. I understand many large companies, Italian companies were there, many large American companies were there. I would like to know what came out of it. Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in two questions. Uh, one, which part of the tech sectors in Italy you feel is the most dynamic and the most competitive globally? And two, what can a country like Italy, and by extension other European countries, like France or, or Spain or Ireland, can do to attract outside investment to a tech sector in order to generate the important spillovers that uh, are at the base of the prosperity of places like, like here? Uh, uh, I'm sure that, uh, not to the Italians, but for many people in the audience, would come as a surprise to learn that we're still the only country uh, in the world that does not have any communication media in English from Italy. So we are constantly intermediated. Uh, and this, is, this creates, of course, uh, misperceptions uh, to the level that even today investors uh, uh, prefer to do business in France rather than in Italy, despite uh, Francois Hollande, which, by the way, increased the tax rate of 75 percent. But labor rigidity and other issues that are on the list of investors are much worse in France than, than they are in Italy. So with this in mind, we have created this summit every year in New York, uh, incrementally bringing more Europe and more Italy uh, to the game for, for two reasons. First of all, uh, because it's always uh, forgotten that Europe remains the largest economic area in the world, $17 trillion compared to 15 in the US. But more importantly, uh, US, and Italy, uh, US and Europe are intertwined economies. Uh, the uh, U.S. remains the employer number one in Europe and vice versa. 40% uh, of the foreign direct investments land either in Europe or in, uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, China is at 220 billion, but uh, a distant fourth, and 65% of or any R&D is done in between uh, or across the Atlantic. So this makes uh, these two economies uh, a very interesting and important, as you know, there is a treaty under discussion, which is called the TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is supposed to move 1% of GDP in both areas. US wants to approve it uh, within the summer, and this should be a game changer in a world that I think we should uh, forget for a while, the world globalization, we're going uh, regional again. As you see, many of these treaties are being discussed, especially led from the US. And the, the very important point is that Italy is part of that uh, uh, major economy, so 800 million uh, consumers. And, and uh, the, the objective that we had at the meeting was to provide a different perspective of Italy. So we have presented with the support of Invitalia, uh, the first book uh, that describes Italy by the numbers, called Italy by the numbers, and what is the equity story, why you should invest now. So it's, it's a different uh, perspective. We had uh, many CEOs from Italy, but from US. We had the CEO of Aon, Siemens US. So uh, the, uh, the CEO of Estelo there. And there was uh, a very, I would say, enthusiastic and optimistic look. And I think the outcome of the summit were primarily three. First was uh, uh, perception. We have to work on communicating a better Italy, ongoing. And we have to do it with a different uh, uh, a budget, if you wish. So we have to deploy much more money in communicating our country. The second uh, uh, outcome was stop, you know, c describing, uh, you know, to the nth details what are the issues. But the third point is focus on opportunities. I think that Italy today provides much more opportunity for investors because we are going to do the reforms. We just mentioned our prime minister. Our prime minister is the third in a sequence that is moving Italy in the right direction. The progression is not linear as we wish, but as a country and as a democratic country, I think we're doing exactly the, on the same path where the UK was with the first Margaret Thatcher government or with the first Ronald Reagan uh, uh, um, uh, the, term. So we're moving in the right direction and the time to invest in Italy is now. 
In terms of sector, I think we are providing, at least New York and San Francisco with our events, uh, a perspective on uh, life science, which I think is very prominent in Italy. Anything that is uh, doing robotics and engineering and aerospace on top of the traditional media. So these are the places where uh, uh, we are trying, with the support of Invitalia, to promote uh, patents becoming enterprises, and I think with a good degree of success. So our goal is that in the next three, four years, to start to make a change to Italy through businesses, and this is the why the partnership with all the uh, uh, companies that work in the same direction is critical in order to, to, to make this change. We have a macro assets. Number one, we keep on being the fourth largest uh, uh, manufacturing economy in the world on a value added per capita the second in Europe. Uh, despite the public finances, which we have, of course, a huge debt, we have a very solid uh, uh, wealth uh, embedded in the family. The net wealth per capita is about over uh, half a million dollar uh, per household in, in Italy. We have uh, great universities. We are, we are very prominent in, in, in uh, uh, scientific papers. If you take the number of citations per dollar invested in R&D, uh, uh, Italy ranks uh, second in the world. So there are all the key ingredients to make this turnaround. So the equity story is that you have to invest now because the, the Euro commitments that we have will force us to do the reforms. So these reforms will be in the direction of being more uh, business friendly. So uh, the list of, of, of the numbers that we provide is the, the, the flip side of what is always seen, big government, the corruption, the inefficiency. So on the other hand, Italy remains an expert-led economy, which is keeping us afloat. We're going through a transition, but the market is doing its job because the companies that are shutting down are the ones that are less fit. So today, what are, what are remaining is the fittest in the market and globally. So this is part of the story that you will be reading in this book. Okay, thanks. Um, Domenico Acuri. You are CEO of uh, Invitalia, which, as I mentioned, is the agency uh, that the Italian government um, has created to attract foreign investment and make it easier for investors to set up shop in, in Italy. Um, two questions for you. First, tell us briefly what you guys are doing uh, to stimulate investment, how much you're spending, which sectors you're targeting, what type of success uh, stories uh, you might have, and also, what is still missing? What, you know, why is in Italy, uh, despite all the strengths of its engineering school, the creativity of its talent, uh, the long tradition of uh, innovation and and uh, making, um, is not more Silicon Valley and it still has an innovation sector that is nascent to to say the least. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, also, I want to start with the second question. Uh, I was impressed uh, in the beginning of the meeting uh, because I read uh, a sentence uh, in the movie that Marco showed, we are all makers of our world. Uh, I think also that we are all makers of our country. So the Italians are makers of our Italy. Uh, I think that the first uh, uh, point that uh, I want to share is that we need uh, to tell a new history of uh, our country. For uh, too many times, uh, Italians uh, uh, world, were world champions to describe in detail our weaknesses. Uh, the perspective of our country is... Uh, uh, a main problem for all of those things that in which we are involved. Investment, but not only the investment. Uh, as you know, yesterday, uh, the great beauty won the Oscar. Uh, uh, we have to work uh, every day, every minute, uh, for uh, uh, do our best uh, in the reaching the goal that the great beauty is not a movie, uh, but something else in our country. Uh, 
Invitalia uh, is a national agency for developing industries and for uh, uh, attracting foreign investment. And I go to your first question. Uh, in, the, in the last months, for the first time after many years, the Italian government launched a program named Destin Destinazione Italia, in English if you want, Destination Italy, uh, in which we built uh, 50 several different uh, uh, issues for uh, uh, creating an environment uh, more attractive for the foreign investors. I add not only for the foreign investors, but also for our domestic investors. Uh, we, uh, for, uh, uh, let's say in that way, for uh, uh, at least 20 years, uh, Italy uh, represents its, uh, herself as a sleeping beauty. Uh, a fantastic young, young lady that spend a lot of time in the bed just waiting to become old. Uh, I think that uh, all of us has to wake up this lady. Uh, now we have a very young <coughs> premier uh, that uh, since the first day is involved in a great plan for reform our bureaucracy, our uh, lifestyle, not only our assets and liabilities, because I'm sure that you know we reformed our assets and liabilities in the last years. At least or more than other European countries that uh, in the same time deliver a fantastic promotion and communication plan of itself instead of reform their asset and their liability. I think we have a huge competitive advantage be because we already reformed our money problem and now we have just to deliver a plan to communicate in detail ourselves and to wake up the sleeping beauty. Uh, Destinazione Italia is one important momentum of this plan, uh, which case we can spend for, uh, as you asked me before, for, uh, let's say, for uh, uh, sharing that is possible for a in foreign investor to, in to invest in our country. Uh, as I told before in a, a very interesting meeting with Steve and some other person, uh, Italian government launched two years ago a plan for uh, uh, give grant for big companies that want, that want to invest in Italy, domestic or foreign companies. The first three companies that invest with a huge investment in our country was, were Rolls-Royce that create a big plant in Campania is not a movie, it's a reality. Uh, Unilever and Vodafone. Three different foreign companies operating in three different sectors that invest their money in Italy, not just because the government gave them a grant, because this is possible and in some way convenient. Uh, we know that we have a huge problem of bureaucracy. That is, the, before then the labor cost, before then the fiscal impact, be, be, before then some other issues that is the main issues of our country. For in the last 20 years, we built a labyrinth in which you go in and you don't know when where a how reach to go out. This is our bureaucracy. So can I, can, can I follow up on that? Because presumably Invitalia was created in part to deal with that. So uh, that I'm sitting here, I have money to invest, I call you. Yes. And how long does it take? 
if I call you yeah. to actual, you know, I have an idea today, how long does it take for me to be, to start operating in Italy if I call you today? And two, what type of grants, you mentioned the grants that these three companies received. What, can you give us a sense of the order of magnitude and what type of sectors are being targeted? Uh, for, after Destinazione Italia, for the first time in our country, we built a one-stop shop company that is in Vitalia, that is the only, let's say, facilitator for a foreign investor that wants to invest in our country. Uh, in Vitalia, bring the investor through the other public administrations for uh, uh, earning time and for uh, uh, create the investment. Uh, we have several services and several instruments and we have a, a grant uh, uh, incentive. Uh, now it's uh, very difficult to explain in a few minutes, but in the three cases that I explained before, we gave at least 40% of the investment in grant. Uh, if I can, I want to... That's, that's a lot. That's, yes, yes. yes. Uh, in, the, in two minutes, I want to describe briefly another experience uh, that seem not coherent with the perspective of Italy that most of you have. In the last September, uh, go our government gave us 190 million euro for uh, uh, incentivated uh, technology startup in the south of our country. Means that we can uh, give uh, maximum 500,000 euro for something like an early seed money for uh, uh, new company, digital or high-tech company that wants to uh, build, be built in uh, the south of our country. That is not a fantastic place for high-tech. This uh, uh, way started in the last September. Today, we received 820 applications, fully paperless. We create an online site, online site. We started with 144 new companies. We rejected 246 business plans. And uh, we, are, uh, we are evaluating other 430 projects. This just in four months. So that is a good news, a new history. Something in Italy works basically like in other countries that uh, use more time than us to market themselves as we have to do as soon as possible more in the future. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. We're going to come back to some of these themes, but let me move to our third panelist, Steve Lusso. Um, Steve, you are one of the most prominent business leaders in the tech community. I understand that you just made a personal investment in Italy. Uh, if my informations are correct, you bought an olive farm in Sicily. Correct me if I'm mistaken. You know, I think it's great that foreigners invest in Italy. Um, indeed, many buy properties in places like Rome, Venice, Tuscany, uh, and Sicily. Uh, in part because Italy is blessed with outstanding natural resources and a unique cultural heritage. Um, and I think the same is probably true for places like France or, or, or Spain. But looking forward, <clears throat> an advanced post-industrial economy probably needs to attract not only low-tech investment in sectors like tourism and agriculture, but also needs to be attractive as a destination for high-tech investment, uh, I would think. So I, I have two questions for you. First, what is the perception that the U.S. tech community has of the tech sector in continental Europe and in Italy in particular? 
my, my guess is that perception is neutral at best, bad at, at worst, um, but you obviously will know more than I do. And second, what can a place like Italy uh, do to be more interesting to an investor, a U.S. investor? What, what would be something that makes a difference for a U.S. investor to actually invest in tech startups or tech established companies in a place like Italy? Well, I'll take the first question first, but remind me what the second one is because I'll forget it. Um, but the, uh, where, our st where I started was, um, and I'll get to the perception, but um, so for me, my uh, grandparents are from Sicily and I was doing scholarship work in my mom's and my grandmother's name. And uh, my grandmother had told me the story of <clears throat> the land that she came from and, um, and how she was always discouraged by the fact that they had, had left this land. And so when I was doing the scholarship work in Corleone, I, I found the land, um, which took a couple of years, and then I rebought the land, uh, which took a couple more years. And it was about one hectare, and I've now repurchased about 250 hectares around it. And, um, and in the course of that, found the foundation of the house that my grandmother was born on, as well as the foundation of the house that my grandfather was born on. And, um, and uh, it was funny because the rumors of, you know, at some point it got out who was buying the land. And uh, the rumors of, you know, what I was doing there was pretty funny. It, it spanned from I was going to build a golf course, which I guess is what Americans do when they go other places, um, to I was um, going to start an atomic research, atomic technology research company. Now, I'm not sure what that is, but that sounds really interesting to me. So. <laughs> Um, but what we are doing is, is growing organic olive oil and, um, and employing a bunch of people who haven't been able to work for a long time. And, and I feel really great about it to be doing that in the land of my maternal grandparents. And, um, but for, for the technology perception, um, Seagate, for those of you who don't know, is 60,000 employees. We do business in... All, all the major countries we manufacture throughout the world. It's one of the last true great manufacturing companies. Um, most manufacturing has been outsourced um, so that most companies aren't vertically integrated anymore, meaning most companies don't own deep core technology that also translates into the capital side of the business. Um, you know, autos kind of disaggregated many years ago. Um, really, the, the only industries left that are, are deep, vertically integrated companies are probably disk drives and, uh, and silicon, where the relationship between the core investment and then the capital to produce that and those technologies is, is highly integrated. So a company like Seagate, we run about um, 15 billion parts a quarter through our factories, um, all in a highly coordinated way, 200 parts per drive. We do about 60 million drives a quarter. And every drive, <clears throat> most people don't realize this, is highly specialized and, and it's, it's not like one disk drive solves all problems. We have, we over, we have over 500 SKUs for you know, individual companies like HP or IBM or Dell. Um, so we kind of search the world for places where we can find the technical talent, the infrastructure, um, the relationships with government entities, incentives, whether or not they're capital related or tax. Um, but the most important thing is long-term access to people, as long as the infrastructure is in place, uh, and rule of law. And so I think the perception, I would say, is actually probably better than you characterize it in terms of, I think most technology companies view Europe and Italy as places with very deep and strong competencies um, in difficult engineering environments. And um, especially, I think, in the servo-mechanical area, where a lot of the world is, is moving away from because everybody wants to be a software engineer. And this week, they want to de de develop algorithms to do search better. You know, Last week, it was big data. The week before that, it was high-frequency trading. Um, but the disciplines around uh, mechanical and electrical engineering and the integration between the two is becoming a very 
unique and highly valu valuable skill set. And I think that's an area where, in, in particular, Italy and Germany probably really stand out versus the rest of Europe. Um, some of the other areas of Europe, the perceptions around software are quite strong, whether or not it's in Ireland or whether or not it's in some of the former Soviet countries um, in France as well. Um, but I think Italy you know, does have an expertise in part because of some of the manufacturing successes like ST Micro um, that are attractive. So I think the perception is pretty good. I think where the challenges are is around the perception of how accessible is that talent pool and how complex are the constructs around either the management of the human resources or the regulatory management in order to basically get as much value out of those assets as possible. And I think this is where the work that's being done is absolutely essential. I mean, to the, to the point where we can get better communication about um, how you can actually deploy and access and, and start a business uh, quickly and, and get through some of the bureaucratic uh, challenges, as well as um, targeting areas of investment, it's just going to make it a lot easier. Seagate does a lot of work in Singapore. We were the first high-tech company really to go and deploy in Singapore. We really established a lot of what became Singapore. Um, HP was there before us, but they were building calculators, um, which wasn't really all that high-tech. Um, and, of course, we have a deep relationship in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> and I would say that the two most beneficial things that the government organizations and joint government commercial organizations do is provide that path for one-stop shopping. Because when a company goes into a country, even though there's a perception of big, bad corporation, you know, we really do go in with the intent of being there forever and for providing jobs and all the great things that you talk about in terms of your multiplier effect. And, but there's also changes in the course of the river and the ability to be flexible about what's really happening in the world relative to what you originally thought and then working through with the company to navigate those, those changes is, is what, in my opinion, makes a difference between why Singapore's been so successful why Ireland's been so successful, frankly, why China's been so successful. Those government agencies are actually put in place to facilitate businesses to do their jobs better, not at the expense of safety or health or you know, all the important things, but really just to facilitate because they believe that the creation of jobs is the most important thing that they can help deliver, and that's more important than taxing companies. And I think actually it's an area where the U.S. has lost its competitiveness. I think Italy has a huge opportunity here with this, the work that, that's being done by these two gentlemen to make it easier because the access to a talented group of people exist. And there's not enough engineers in the world to go around, um, and especially in particular disciplines. Um, and those are disciplines that I think actually Italy is quite strong in. That, that's very useful. Uh, Can I ask just a quick follow-up? Um, how many employees did you say Seagate has worldwide? Uh, 60,000. 60,000. How many countries you guys are in? 39, something 39. like that. Yeah. Understand Ireland is one? Yes. Yeah. Are there any other European countries you're in? Um, we have manufacturing in Northern Ireland. We have, yeah, we have offices in, in Paris and in Italy and Germany, but those are mostly sales and support. Right. Um, we have a big distribution ha um, hub in Amsterdam. Um, but the manufacturing is, and R&D, and it's a great transition. You know, we originally went to Northern Ireland um, because one of our processes is, is very silicon-like. We make wafers <clears throat> that become the heads that read and write on the disk. Um, it's a very capital-intensive process, um, and it's very technical, so there was university support and capital support. <coughs> but originally, that facility was kind of built to be a lower cost producer of this technology when we started it 20 years ago. Um, about 10 years ago, when I took over Seagate the first time, we started to basically increase the R&D aspect of what that facility does. And now today, that facility is on the leading edge of the technology that we put into our wafers, which is the most high-tech thing that we do. 
um, and probably more than half of our wafer technology is, is now developed right. in Ireland. So, And I imagine this is great for Ireland because before they used to have production jobs only, now they have production jobs and R&D jobs. It's changed, it, it's, changed, it's changed the city. The city that we do um, work in is Derry, um, which is, you know, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, and it was a, a city that was particularly burdened by the troubles. And um, no, it's, it's changed the entire profile of the city. Okay. Yeah. This is great. Um, this actually is a good segue to, to uh, my question to John Hartnett. Um, Hartnett. Um, now, John, you're obviously very familiar with Ireland um, and its experience. Uh, Ireland is a very interesting case because over the last four decades, it has grown uh, from one of the poor countries of Europe, a country where very few, now forget about ITAC, but very few manufacturing companies would locate, to a country that has been a magnet for uh, all level of, of manufacturing and, and, and ITAC and financial uh, services. Um, another, unlike other continental European countries, it has adopted a very pro-business stance on a number of fronts. Um, and uh, it, has, it has had enormous success. Uh, now, the years 2008-2011 have been particularly tough. Uh, they've been tough for everybody, but particularly for, for Ireland. Um, but it seems that the country has turned a corner, and it seems like if one steps back and look at where Ireland was 40 years ago and where Ireland is today, by and large, this was a success story. Um, Kind of like the success story that I was talking about earlier today, you know, the Austins or the Raleigh Durham. Uh, you know, not much of an economy in 1970 or 1980, global uh, innovation hubs today. Um, two questions for you, like everybody else. Uh, what has been the secret of this success? Um, sh should Italy or countries like Italy try to emulate it, try to copy it? Um, and two, how successful is really Ireland as a tech ecosystem? I mean, we, we heard about the Seagate experience, but is it only, and obviously Seagate, it, it, it's, a, you know, it's a very awful story, but is Ireland able to attract uh, only production companies or it's all both about production and R&D? Uh, when you attract finance, is it only back offices or it's also the, the, the place where you know, the upper management leads and, and, and and, uh, and, and all the high paying jobs are. Um, so you can start from question one, question two. Okay, so thank choice. you. Um, well, first and foremost, I don't work for the government. I've kind of lived all my life uh, working in technology. I've never actually worked for an Irish company or a European company. I've worked with US multinationals all my life. And in fact, I started on the factory floor of a company called Wang back in 1980 at 17 years of age. And I've ended up here in Silicon Valley 16 years ago as senior vice president of Palm, and now I'm an investor. So I've kind of lived partly through that whole success story. I think the first thing from an Ireland perspective is it's not an overnight you know, success. It didn't happen in the last five years or 10 years. It's been in the making for 40 years. And um, its track record has helped get it to where it is today. So for example, today in Ireland, you know, it's the headquarters, European headquarters for companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Dropbox are there. But also over the last, you know, 40 years, it also has the likes of Intel who've been there for 25 years and have a number of fab plants. And obviously Seagate are in both Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. And they've had a history of working in, in Ireland. And I would say, to your point, it's, Ireland has gone through the evolution of being the low-cost player uh, in, in Europe and being a small country and focusing on manufacturing, whereas today the focus is on R&D. And it's also the focus on our own companies. Ireland wants to make its own Facebooks and Googles uh, as well. So Ireland has kind of gone through that whole transition. Um, in terms of some of the ingredients of success, um, some of these have, have, have happened by necessity. Ireland is not a, a big country, it's a very small country. The population of Ireland is about four and a half million people. And um, Ireland, you know, lost more than half the people from Ireland leaving Ireland. 
So the government really got back together in the, in, the, in the 70s and decided that it was going to invest in education. And it also made education free. So what has happened is that education is very low cost, so therefore it's the highest, um, the highest numbers of students are coming through. Over 80% of Irish graduates are, are third level graduates or fourth Talking level graduates. Talk about college. A college, yes. Free college. Yes. Um, that really has paid off in a big way because, you know, companies will obviously come for competitive reasons in terms of costs, etc. But companies come to Ireland and stay because of people and because of the talent. And I think that's kind of been the secret sauce of, of Ireland. It's just the talent that's there. Um, the government have been quite uh, influential in this. It's a very pro-business um, there are two big agencies in Ireland. One is focused on uh, bringing foreign direct investment into Ireland called the IDA and in Nor Northern Ireland it's uh, Invest Northern Ireland. And then the other part is Enterprise Ireland and their focus is on building Irish companies. So it's kind of like focus on, on both, both areas. And um, what they have done is basically one, make it competitive in terms of cost perspective. They've made sure that the costs are, are, are very much in line with its, it, you know, its, its, its peers in the, in the marketplace. Um, they've also put a whole package of incentives to incent uh, companies to come to Ireland, everything from training grants to employment grants. And obviously Ireland has a 12.5% tax rate, which is obviously a very powerful tool that it, that it has used. And, uh, and it's obviously been a big part of the, uh, the tools that Ireland has had. One of the softer tools that Ireland has, has used and has leveraged, um, which Italy has exactly the same thing, if not bigger, is its relationship with the United States. Ireland's relationship with the United States is not in the last 40 years. It's in the last 400 years. Um, in the last 400 years, Irish people have come to the United States so you have a very uh, deep relationship with the United States and also a, a big number. I, I mentioned the population of Ireland is, is uh, four and a half million. The population of Irish America is 43 million. There are 10 times more Irish or Irish Americans than there are actually in Ireland. I believe the same is, is for Italy. And that is a phenomenal power that you have in Italy that I think could be a great strength to, to drive business and, and drive yeah, the relationship. Um, you know, low taxes, pro-business, Italy is not very, but a lot of immigrants in the US, yes, we have it. <laughs> and events like this are really intended to leverage that stock of human capital and, and that back and forth between the two countries, which uh, it's, it's a clearly a comparative advantage of, of places like Italy. Yeah, I, I wouldn't underestimate the power of the diaspora and the power of the people. Steve, for example, just talked to you about the story of his grand, great grandfather in, in Sicily. Um, same thing happens in Ireland. That's a, it's not the decision making point, but it, also, it, it is also a relationship that's very, very strong. Absolutely.